Hello and welcome to the next in our series of Inside the Tanks um, and it's with great pleasure and due to popular demand that we're, today we're going to look at the fantastic Tiger One. Not only any old Tiger One of course, this is Tiger 131, the only fully functioning Tiger One actually currently in existence in the world as we speak. Relatively few of course Tiger Ones were ever produced, only 1,354 between 1942 and 1944. We're now joined by David Willey who is the curator of the Tank Museum here in Bovington. Thank you very much for joining us David. A bit of history about the marvellous Tiger 131. This particular Tiger was captured in North Africa in early 1943. It was sent out at the end of those seesaw battles that had been going across the North African desert out to Tunisia when finally Hitler realises the Germans are going to lose. He then reinforces the German army there with his latest secret weapon, that's the Tiger. So a number of them are sent across the Mediterranean. This one is serving with the 504th Schwer Panzer Battalion, um, the 504th Heavy Tank Battalion. It's on a hillside at a place called Medjel Bab. British tanks are attacking it. They're Churchill tanks that are firing at it. We know it knocks out at least a couple of those Churchill tanks. But then we can see damage on this tank that we can now surmise why the German crew abandoned the tank. They didn't blow it up, they should have done. Um, that was the orders of the time, it was a secret weapon. You should destroy your tank if you're going to abandon it. But we think that one of the key rounds that was fired by a Churchill tank it goes under the barrel, we can look at that damage in a moment, and it wedges the turret to the hull. In other words, it goes underneath the point meeting between the turret and the hull, jams in there so the crew can't actually traverse the turret. And whether they were wounded, we just don't know. We've never been able to find out or actually track down the actual crew. They abandoned the tank. The German war diary actually uses the word panic um, when they leave that tank. Um, it's the first Tiger we've captured intact on the battlefield in the West. So let's have a look at the damage. Um, you can see here on the mantlet and the beginning of the barrel, the damage as a round has been coming in, it's clipped underneath, clipped the mantlet there, and actually then wedged between the turret and the hull. At the time, the gun was facing forward and it actually depressed the roof above the driver and the co-driver. And we've got photographs of the time. It shows a fair bit of damage went on there. Again, whether that wounded the crew, we just don't know. You can also see where another, we think six pound around from one of the Churchill guns that's firing, has clipped off the side of the lifting eye here and it's exposed the bare metal. Um, so another round's gone there. And around on the vehicle as well, you can also see other bits of damage, which we assume this is probably from shrapnel. So exploding high explosive rounds and there's more damage on the rear. Um, so obviously shell fires going off around the vehicle at the time as well. So we can see that sort of damage. We know that the loader's hatch, not the commander's hatch, the loader's hatch, the square hatch, was actually damaged as well. We've got photographs when it was first hit, that was broken, subsequently that was replaced. Um, so again, whether the crew were damaged in, in that, that action, again, we just don't know. But whatever happened, the crew abandoned the tank. Again, the German war diary, diary it says, they use the word in the war diary, panic. The crew of Tiger 131 panic and abandoned the tank. And the following day, the 48th Royal Tank Regiment, who have these Churchill tanks, they've been attacking up the hill, they've had losses, they are back on the battlefield, and they find this tank sitting there, um, abandoned. And they go across it, they have a look at it, they knock out the wedged-in shell, we realise we've got the first captured Tiger tank. And it's photographed and filmed in situ before it's then recovered back it goes to Tunis, where Churchill comes out, he sees it in Tunis, um, the King sees it, it's put on show. It's then taken back to Britain, where it's taken to a place called Chertsey, where they do all the experimental analysis. They have a really good look at it there. They take it apart, they measure it, they record it, they make a massive report on it put it back together again, they fire the gun, they do all sorts of things, and it's only till 1951, well after the war, that it's then handed over to the Tank Museum. Um, and it's been here, obviously, a very popular exhibit for many, many years. 
And at the end of the 1990s, we started a program to get it back into running order. And now, every now and again, we take it out, special event, special occasion, we let people know we're gonna run it, and we drive it around our track. Okay, we're now gonna look in a bit more detail at some of the, uh, the finite bits of Tiger One. First thing, starting off on the left there, obviously, then the track guards. Um, interesting thing about the Tiger One was that both the track guards, left and right, actually lifted up. It's gained access there. And also, you note that everything is hinged on the side. The reason being, of course, Tiger One had a transit track. Um, so when it was to go on a railway, I, because of the, the width of some of the tunnels, you couldn't actually get it on there with the normal track on. So they put a transit track on there. And everything then hooked up, and the splash guards, etc., were removed to allow it to gain access. Another thing to note on there, you've got a eyelet. Um, the reason for the eyelet was it just means that a lifting frame can be fitted in there. When the lifting frame's in there, there's a hook and weight on the end, and it means that they could assist when they're changing the sprockets on the track. Moving away across to the right, first we come across, of course, is where the bow gunner stroke the radio operator, as they were one and the same person, actually was positioned inside. Um, you can see on the outside there, the mounting for the MG34. Um, interesting thing obviously about this was the movement wise it had 15 degrees of movement left and right bilaterally and also minus 10 to plus 20 degrees of movement uh, in the vertical. Now obviously Tiger 1, one of the things about Tiger 1 was it was or were capable of doing deep wading. However records show that it never actually carried out any deep wading but because of that it made it quite expensive as well and the design process was um, on the outside there is a rim um, and also you can see there's two eyelets there with uh, butterfly screws. Um, when it was preparing for deep wading, it just means that a cover could go on there, obviously to protect the bow mounting gunner there, and also prevent any ingress of water going in. Moving away across the right hand side, we now really come across to the driver's station. Armoured driver's hatch, which could be closed from the inside as well. A couple of interesting points, if you notice on the top there, you've got two weld marks. This was initially where the early version of Tiger 1 would have had the binocular type periscope fitted, but this was replaced um, later on in the design stage. And of course, finally, finishing off really with the other side, um, identical to the left hand side of the track, and again, elevating up or can be moved up as well. OK, moving down the side of the Tiger then, um, you can see more clearly the track configuration. And again, we've got the driver later on to give us a much more detailed thing on there. Um, I already mentioned about the transit tracks. Just a point to note on the transit tracks is when they were fitted, all the outer rear road wheels were taken off, obviously, uh, to make it easier to fit. A couple of things to notice on here. Um, on top, you can see we've got a tow rope. Um, and also, although not the original, of course, you'd also have a track rope located on the side here as well. Moving our way back down, you can see very clearly there at the moment, a good position of it is the mount loop, um, which actually housed the, obviously the 88mm gun. Interesting point about this is we know this is one of the first 100 production models of this particular mantlet. The reason we know that is because it's got the cutaway portion in this side. Um, the reason being, of course, at one stage um, when the uh, Porsche thought he was going to actually have the contracts to produce all of the chassis, etc., for the Tiger 1, produced these turrets because the raised engine decks at the rear um, on the Porsche variant meant it would snag unless it had a raised portion on there. So we know by that that this was one of the first 100 production models. Now, of course, the thing that really made the Tiger one very distinctive and very impressive on the battlefield was the use of the 88mm. This was based on the um, anti-aircraft gun, the Flax 36, and actually Hitler himself insisted that the Flax 36 was mounted onto a tank chassis. This, of course, caused huge problems because the recoil was absolutely intensive. And what you will find on the Tiger One is use of a hydrodynamic buffer and a recuperator, very similar to what you get on modern main battle tanks. And we'll see that a bit later on when we get inside the turret. Again, another thing that made it very distinctive at the time was, of course, the armour protection. The armour protection made it almost, in the initial stages of the war, almost impervious to anything that the Allies could throw against it. And at its thickest part, it is 100 millimetres. It was using rolled homogenous armour. Again, the rolling process actually made it toughened and made it stronger than anything else the Allies had at the time. And another thing, while we're talking about the recoil that's produced by the 88mm, also you find at the end of the barrel there, very distinctive, is the double baffle muzzle brake. The reason for this, of course, actually reduced almost 70% of the recoil that you'd find inside the turret. And actually it was that important that if it was damaged during a conflict or during operations, the crews were told not to fire the main armament. OK, we're now going to start moving up onto the turret. Just a couple of things to point out here. Obviously, the crew positions we're going to have a look at in more detail later on. But as I'm looking down forwards at the tank now, on the right-hand side, you've got where the bow gunner radio operator actually sat. Very simple hatches, um, and he also had his own periscope fitted there as well. Notice the rubber seals you've got all the way around. Working our way across towards where the driver's position is, you've got a jacking block, 
various tall stowage positions, and you've also got a breather there for ventilation. And finishing across the left-hand side there, we've got the driver's hatch. Again, we're going to have a look at that and get inside in more detail in a bit. But the interesting thing to know, and I must admit I didn't know until we came down here, when you see all the films, um, the photos, etc., of somebody with their head out driving the Tiger, it would have been a physical impossibility. Because as you look down in there, you can see that both the driver and the bow gunner are more positioned centrally towards the um, centre of the tank. So it must have been somebody else sat on the side there, which is quite an interesting point. Look at the side of the turret, we've already explained the trunnions. You can um, also see the trunnions from out there and the mantlet cover. We see the first of our smoke grenade discharges. Tiger 1 had two banks of smoke grenade dischargers, uh, three on either side of the turret, one mounted left and right, and the controls for this are inside the commander's station. We'll have a look at those in the moment. And also, you can see there, we're looking at the right-hand side of the turret, you've also got the first of our vision ports there. This would have been the vision port for the loader station, um, and gave him a very, very narrow field of view through there. Okay, we're now moving up on top of the turret, and a few things to point out. Um, the first thing I want you to notice there is the emergency or escape hatch. Uh, which is located on the rear right hand side of the turret. Incredibly heavy um, and a bit of a design problem there that once it was open it would just drop away, obviously open from the inside, drop away but it needed somebody on the outside to actually push it back in position again. Um, and also you see on a lot of records they actually used that when they were restowing the ammunition on the Tiger 1. So it's quite a quick way to put ammunition through there uh, and straight into the turret. But we'll look at the turret in a minute. Another couple of things to point out, we've also got the um, armoured cover for the ventilation fan. There's a fan underneath there that provides ventilation for the crew inside. And also, very, very simple design for the loader's hatch. Two positions on the loader's hatch, opened or it could be just left ajar as well to allow some air to come in there. And again, notice quite hefty rubber seals around the hatches. Located on the back of the turret was the only stowage that we can find on Tiger 1. Okay, quite a small bin and you'd find in here some of the tools and also some of the crew belongings as well. Um, so you'd find a bin on there. Quite an interesting thing about Tiger 131 was it's actually the original padlocks that came with it, which is obviously very, very unusual. Moving away across, um, we've got a port here. This is a small arms port. And all it meant was obviously the crew had some means there if people mounted the tank, whether it's on the turret or the back decks, they could actually put perhaps one of the small arms, the MP40, through there and fire on them as well. Okay, so just a small port there. Working our way across, and the final thing really we've got located on the turret, or the final two things we've got located on the turret, we've got another one of our vision slits, okay? Um, you can find it, the periscope or episcope is located behind there. This particular one is where the gunner would sit, just behind this wall. And finally, the last of our smoke grenade discharges. Okay, looking at the commander's station then, very, very simple conical design. Um, again, with a very simple commander's hatch there, with a very heavy duty rubber seal located around the outside. A few of the key things to point on now, you can see there are a number, again, of vision slits. Behind there are located the periscopes, which you'll see when we get inside the commander's cupola. Um, and also, the azimuth indicator, located underneath the rim here, numbered 1 to 12, all around the outside. And all it was was a very simple way that the commander could lay the gunner, he's got a similar thing just to the left of him in the gunner station, onto a target. But again, we'll have a look at that in more detail in the gunner station when we get inside there. The final thing to know, two hollow tubes you can see there, they were just the means there used to be a sun shield that could actually go up and protect the crew against the sun. We're now lucky enough to be joined by Ian, and Ian is one of the drivers here at the Tank Museum of the fantastic Tiger One. Um, Ian, thanks very much for joining us. On tanks, every morning what we'd have to do was a first parade, and of course the Tiger One was no different. So to give you an idea now what the first parade actually involved on the Tiger One, Ian's going to take us on a quick spin round. On the Tiger, first parade. It's quite a long-winded process, so it does drag on, but it's better to be safe than sorry. The first thing we do check on the outside of the Tiger, or the exterior, is tracks. Uh, tracks are really important because track wear and um, track pins. Each pin has a clip on the end so it retains the uh, pin within the, each link so you've got to watch out for things like that so nothing comes apart. Slack in the track so if there's too much slack it's going to be too sloppy, it's going to make the drive not very good on the tank so we always check adjustment. On each side obviously it's what's known as called the uh, final drive. Uh, within the final drive is filled with oil so the other thing we have to do is check the oil levels. If the oil's too low, obviously it can cause a catastrophic failure within the final drive, which we don't want. So they're checked as well. You've got one this side and obviously one on the driver's side. What's your drip tray for then? In? That's uh, a leak. <laughs> yeah, that's, you always get a leak, so, <laughs> out, so but as long as you check it and you check the right levels, happy days. We check for sprocket wear, any pickup marks on the teeth, we try to keep a, an eye on those. Uh, road wheels. Uh, we try. Every wheel station is greased, 
So that has to be checked as well and greased up. The rubber on the road wheels, we check there's no more um, being picked off or it's cracking or it's deteriorating. So we keep an eye on the road wheels. We've got some uh, access panel here. This really is for the inertia starter. You can take it off and visually get in, inside with a torch and look all within the engine bay. Um, you've got coolant pipes, you've got the, obviously the engine there and just checking for any suspect oil leaks and that, anything we find. As you can see, it's pretty dry on the floor, you know, but obviously there's things called belly plates on the hull of the Tiger. Sometimes we take those off and just double check so there's any leaks or anything like that. I'd that say that's pretty amazing because even on Challenger 1, Challenger 2, you find drip trays underneath it and leaks yeah. and all the rest of it. Yeah. So. it you don't get me wrong, you're going to get the odd leak. Yeah, you yeah. Know? But going back to the adjustment of the tracks, the track adjusters are housed in here. Wow, that's really unusual. Yeah, so they're in there. So it works on like a cam sort of idea. So it's adjust the tracks. So that's all up housed in there. And when you said about the um, track tension, eh, what is, what's the sort of right track tension then? I mean, I would suggest at the moment, obviously, that. Uh, the track is just got to be touching the second road wheel end on okay. the outer edge. So it's just it's just right where it is now. OK, there were two ways to start the Tiger 1. The first one, obviously, was a very traditional method, um, using the electronic start in the driver's cab. And the other way was to do an inertia start. Um, so Ian's now just going to quickly take us through and demonstrate to us as well how you do an inertia start. First of all, we have the uh, access cover. That has to be removed. And then we've got the adapter plate for the inertia start handle. And Lower down here mounted is the actual handle for the inertia starter. And then you push that keyway in and it engages the starter on a flywheel and boom. Easy? No. <laughs> <laughs> We've now moved up onto the back decks um, and he's going to give us a quick spin round what we actually do on a first parade on there. Within the engine compartment there's uh, more or less uh, three main things to check. We've got things what's called the fan drive gearboxes. Uh, one's located on the left side, one's located on the right side. They have got oil in them and dipsticks so they'll be dipped and checked. We do them when they're stationary and you, what we do is when we run the tank and we've got them engaged, we check them as well when the engine's running and the, the fans are engaged. So you check them as well. The next thing is, is the main engine oil. Main engine oil is practically directly underneath me. There is a, because uh, it's a dry sump, there's a separate oil tank. Uh, there's a dipstick underneath there as well. What we do is pull the dipstick out. Obviously there's oil on the dipstick, it's safe to start. We put the dipstick back in and the other thing is just another visual check all around the engine. We've got coolant pipes, petrol pipes, any sort of smells that we're not, you know, with fuel because being a petrol uh, driven engine, you've got to be safety all the time. Carry on with the uh, first parade on the Tiger. Uh, the coolant side is checking the coolant on Tiger. Um, either side or the rear of the tank are two radiators. To check it, we've got this radiator here down by my foot. Uh, obviously, just we undo the cap and check the level for the coolant in there. Make sure there's no leaks or anything, or there's no damage or anything to the radiators. Also on the coolant side, uh, where Richard stood, underneath the uh, the grills there are the coolant fans. There's two uh, fans each side. So what we do on the first place, those will be lifted, and we will inspect the fans for any wear, any damage, and make sure they're moving freely. To check the fuel. Um, it was round here on this side of the deck of the tank. There is another access panel that I've removed, and there's the top of the fuel tank. That's the way we will fill the fuel tank is there. Uh, we haven't got a luxury like a fuel gauge, right? We just use a, a measuring stick to check the quantity of fuel within the fuel tanks. So basically, uh, that's about the bits that we do on the outside of the rear deck of the um, Tiger. OK, we're now obviously going to look at the driver's cab on the Tiger 1. Um, the first thing that's very noticeable, certainly for me when you get in there, is the fact that the hatch is offset, um, which is quite unusual. And also, um, it actually looks quite comfy. Directly in front is also a steering wheel, again, quite unusual for any tank designed to have a steering wheel there. Um, and what Ian's going to do now is quickly take us around and point out some of the major controls that you find in the driver's cab. Basic controls on a, in the driver's compartment are, as you can see, we've got a steering wheel. That's a hydraulic, you know, power-assisted steering. And also, a secondary form of steering is like the old traditional way, is the tiller sticks located by my right knee and my left knee. Driving the Tiger, 
Uh, it's quite hard to actually see out within the vision slot up here. You cannot see any of the track guards or the front of the tank, so I'm solely relying on people guiding me. But once we're in the arena, if we have a display, it's not too bad. But in close quarters, it can be a bit tricky. So that's why we always have people on the ground so I can visually see and in radio contact. You've got to keep one eye what's going on within the vision block outside. And the other eye, you've got to keep an eye on the temperature, oil pressure and the revs. Most important thing is the oil pressure. We've got an oil pressure gauge in here. As soon as the tank starts, it should be more or less off the scale, so we've got a good pressure. Another important factor is coolant. Other controls are, to my right, the choke lever. Majority of the time, we do give it a bit of choke, and also, when you go to start the tank, within, I'll show you later on, in the fight compartment, there is a primer unit for fuel. And also, in the driver's mode, you've got the pedals down here, very close together, almost like a Formula One sort of car. It's so tight. If you've got big boots on, it's quite awkward to drive. Um, you've got the accelerator pedal, brake, clutch, just like on a car. And also, running right in front of you, you've got the output shafts, the drive shafts on the gearbox, through the steering uh, assembly, uh, brake assembly, out to the final drives. On my left, uh, we've got the handbrake. I'll just pull on. So, you've got the main handbrake, so that's there. Also, on the Tiger, uh, when selecting gear, what we have is a uh, transfer lever, which is situated here by my right knee, um, which indicates uh, neutral, reverse or forward. Uh, also, above that is an engagement knob. You depress the knob in on the transfer box, and then you can engage forward or reverse. Also, here is the gear ratios. On a Tiger, you can pull away from one to four, anything in between those uh, gear ratios, but depending on the terrain, Normally, the, but the Tiger has eight forward gears and four reverse. Also, in the uh, driver's compartment, as opposed to the other side where the uh, machine gunner sits and the radio operator, you have these uh, filler necks. These are for the final drives that I was showing you from the uh, outside during the first parade. This is where you fill them up through these. Um, they're just vented. They've got a little bit like a vent tube on the top, but um, that's where they're filled up from. So, you know, they obviously thought of everything, you know, to do that, make it so much easier to work on this tank. Where we are now, we're in the fighting compartment. Underneath our feet is the uh, turret floor, and housed underneath there is the batteries. Uh, normally, on the original in Tiger, there would have been about four batteries, but um, this one's been we've been modified this one just to run on the two batteries. So they would be under the turret floor. They would be reconnected and checked, obviously, to make sure they got enough charge to start the Tiger. The secondary bit for the um, starting sequence is here. We have a primer, a fuel primer, uh, which can fill the carburetors up with fuel so what it is takes is about six to eight pumps um, on the primer and then it gives it enough fuel within the carbs to start the engine so there's the primer down on to the right here is the fuel valves for the fuel tank there's one on the right here and there's also another one on the left over there but we do not use those two tanks it's just solely the ones on the right hand side so they would be switched to position three which is a main uh, fuel tank um, position two is reserve, and position one is fully off. So the fuel valves, are always we always keep them off all the time until we use the vehicle. So that will be turned on number three to start the tank, and also the main uh, switch of it all is the master switch, the main power. So once that's initiated and turned on, then it's down over to the driver to start the tank. If there's any problems or there's anything that's going to happen or there's a suspect uh, fuel leak or fire. You turn the master switch off straight away and kill the fuel. That's why when we first prayed it and start the tank, you've always got two or three people with you to help you out, fire watch and for safety reasons. So, right, if we take it from the master switches on and the fuel was turned on, the next point, of course, is for me to start the uh, tank itself. So the first thing you gotta do, obviously, is check, make sure the steering is centralized and I Depress the clutch with my foot, making sure the tank does not move at all. Handbrake is applied as well. On the side of the gearbox here is a little black knob. Then that engage, when you push that, that can engage the forward or reverse uh, motion of the tank for the transfer lever. What I do is I make sure the transfer lever is in neutral. 
and then what I do is we've got a, the ignition panel here, hence the uh, ignition key, and then I click twice, one, two, and then the ignition should come on and it should be ready for the start. Also, there is a choke lever down to my right hand side. I would give the, the tank a little bit of choke. The guy in the back as well, they would prime the engine with a few uh, pumps on the fuel primer so the engine's got plenty of fuel in it ready to fire up. And then you press the ignition switch and then the tank will fire up and usually I take it to about a thousand RPM. If I let the tank idle too much, it, it sort of like clogs itself up, it starts to choke. So it's nice to start out and give it a good thousand revs and then it clears it out and it warms the tank up a lot quicker. And then eventually I'll, I'll take the choke off and then she hopefully she'll start warming up nicely then. Just to get all the uh, oils up to temperature because it's important on the gearbox on the transmission side that the oils are up to temperature. If they're not up to temperature then it makes the uh, gear selection uh, very hard. So basically that's it. Ian's already taken us through the driver's position. What we've done now is pop across um, to the right of the driver and we're now in the radio operator or the bow gunner's position. So the bow gunner was exactly the same person that operated the radios. Quite clearly on the left there you can see the original radios that come with Tiger 131. Um, various combinations of radios obviously depending on whether it was a command vehicle or not. Short wave usually, um, however the command vehicles have the ability to actually do uh, longer signals, i.e. Um, more high powered. Very simple in this position here and actually it's quite comfy and quite roomy. You can see directly in front of me is one of our, the first of our two MG34s. Obviously the other one is mounted with coaxially with the main armament. The setup for it is quite simple. The interesting thing to note of course for the MG34 was slightly different to the ones that were ground mounted or mounted on armoured vehicles. The fact that the barrels on the um, armoured vehicle ones were three quarters armoured. So um, that was just to protect it against shrapnel etc. A very simple brow pad um, that the bow gunner used to use there and also a very simple um, singular sighting system that was used um, to aim it. You'll also notice, as Ian mentioned before there, also to the front of here you can see the transmission assembly um, right down at the front there. So obviously, as Ian said, when you are driving it, incredibly noisy, not only for the driver but also for the bow gunner. Across the right hand side, stowage, you can see where the rounds were kept there um, and also there are various stowage positions all over, we'll look at some of those later on, um, for the main armament rounds. The majority being held actually inside the turret, under the turret floor. And as Ian pointed out in the driver's cab, um, one of the filler points for the final drive. Um, so obviously one of the driver's cab, and this is the one across the right hand side, uh, for the other side. We've now, I've moved down from the commander station into the gunner station, so directly beneath where the commander would sit. Uh, as you can see, not a great deal of room, just to the right of me is the breech and the breech assembly. Straight ahead of the gunner is the gunner site, in this case it's the 9 Bravo um, binocular type site. Quite a very simple and very effective sight, gave you 2.5 times magnification and a field of view of 25 degrees. The graphical pattern was also quite simple and hopefully we'll be able to give you a close-up of that later on, but in essence it consisted of a number of inverted V's on the graphical pattern. Moving across from that and directly located underneath where the breech is, you can see we've got the elevation hand wheel, so that means that the gunner can elevate and press the main armament. And another important part of the elevation hand wheel, of course, is on the other side, We've also got the trigger, which is used by the gunner when firing the main armament. A couple of very important things on the floor, directly beneath the gunner we've got a number of foot pedals. The one of them is a rocker type pedal, and this was the means for power traverse um, for the Tiger 1. So pushing forward and putting it down with your heel on there would turn the turret left and right under power traverse as well. And it was possible at full speed to do a complete 360 in 60 seconds on Tiger 1. And the final pedal for the gunner, down on the gunner's position, is a very simple pedal there that fires the MG34. So that's the means that he does it. Although apparently not particularly reliable as obviously it is relying on a number of linkages linking up to the MG34. Moving across the left hand side then of the gunner's station, one of the most important things was the azimuth indicator. Um, it's exactly the same as we mentioned already on the commander's station, the azimuth indicator. Again, numbered from 1 to 12, so again, it's the way that the commander and the gunner can link up. Commander could lay the gunner on quite quickly using that. Vision block on the left-hand side there, we saw from the outside of the turret the vision block um, and obviously the periscope that we've got there. Directly above that were two breathing tubes. Um, the breathing tubes, the only reason for them was it's just the means that the, air, uh, the crew could get fresh air using the breathing tubes with, as opposed to putting on and wearing the full respirators or gas mask, which obviously was quite problematic. And finally, we have the emergency gun firing circuit. So if there were problems, there's still a means for them to get the prime and charge that would set off the primer for the main armament.
And the final thing to mention the Gunners station then is obviously the Travers hand wheel. If there was a problem and we couldn't use power Travers, there's the ability there to use the Travers hand wheel. Um, before it could be used, there is, you although you won't be able to see it, underneath the turret seal there is a locking lever that needs to be disengaged on there. OK, now looking at the commander station, you can see there the angle I'm actually sat up at the moment is quite limited for space in here. Working our way around, obviously you've got the seats, which is just underneath the camera at the moment there. Um, you've also got the Travis gearbox. Located on the Travis gearbox was a hand wheel for the commander. Um, this was the auxiliary uh, hand wheel for the turret Travis. You can also see there, we mentioned about the smoke grenade discharges on the outside of the, the vehicle. Um, this is one of the control panels to find one of the banks. And located underneath there, there are just three buttons that actually fire the smoke grenade discharges. Various storage located around where the commander would sit, storage for the gas mask, uh, storage for a flare pistol, and also any storage for small arms as well. Um, and also, we'll get to rotate around at the moment, you can see where we pointed on the outside of the turret, you've got the, the ports there where the commander can fire a small arms actually outside. Located around the number of vision blocks, six vision blocks as we pointed from the outside. And also, if you went up, you might be able to make out the azimuth indicator located or numbered 1 to 12 on the interior of the commander's capola or turret ring there, just at the top. Last thing to point out, the commander's station, you've got this uh, thin metal shield here. The only reason the shield was put there was to prevent or in the eventuality of a flashback in the turret, um, that would give the commander some protection. We're now in the loading station and a few of the key things to point out. Now obviously one of the big things about Tiger ones we mentioned earlier on was the fact that the gun was absolutely so potent with the 88mm. A few key things to point out on the breach then, one of the most obvious things there you can see the transit bar. And all the transit bar did was hook the breach up when the gun was not in combat use to prevent damage to it as well. As we said before, the recoil was a real problem for the 88mm uh, fitting it onto the chassis. So what they did was actually put a recuperator and a buffer on there to absorb some of that recoil. One of the things I will put out is in the moment as well as also the recoil indicator. Another couple of key things on there, just to the floor there, you can see there's a catcher tray. All that did was actually catch the empty cases when they came out of the breach. And also, just to the right of the breach, there was a safe fire lever. Um, again, very, very simple design. It just meant that the loader had to make sure it was in the fire position, otherwise the electric circuit wouldn't be completed prior to firing. Moving away across to the right, you can see, although not feared at the moment, was the mounting for the MG34. Um, again, reports of lots and lots of problems with the MG34 on Tiger One as far as stoppages were concerned. Also, you notice just to the right of the mount there, there's the number two. Um, you may have noticed that we've been going around, there are various numbers located in Tiger 131. It is numbered one to 14, and all that meant was it was the 14 checks that before Tiger 1 did uh, deep wading that would have to be done beforehand. So there are 14 things that had to be dealt with before it could submerge or do deep wading. Moving away across to the right there, you also see, again, it's mark number eight, one of the vision blocks we saw from the outside there. So the loader had a pretty poor field of view from the inside there. The loader did have his own seats in the stow position at the moment. It just swings out and, puts, and folds down there. And also the stowage. Now the stowage on Tiger 1, it was capable of carrying 92 rounds. Um, the rounds themselves were usually an equal split between high explosive and armoured piercing. Various stows positions, there are some stows positions underneath the floor, there's also some next to the driver and there are also some stows positions on the sills located around the outside there. You can just see at the moment one of the rounds located in there. Clipped into position uh, and very easy to get to. As we mentioned before, the hardest thing by far uh, with the Tiger was actually restowing it after they'd run out of ammunition. Moving away across to the right, uh, we've also got another gas mask on there and you can see now the inside of the emergency or escape hatch um, with a very, very good thing telling you it's very heavy on there, which we said before. And also, you can see just to the top right of that, we looked at it from the outside of the turret, we've also got a ventilation fan. And also on the right hand side, we have the gun balance spring casing, which in essence is just an oversized damper. And finally, the loaded station, I'm just moving across here, you can see there is a leather pad there. That was just to actually buffer some of the rounds as they were ejected from the breach. Also, we've already pointed out there that they're catching the empty projectiles. And what I mentioned before there, really in essence, a recoil indicator, which interestingly enough has sort of not changed in design much to, to many tanks. All the recoil indicator was, we've already said it's hydraulically assisted the breach. It was just an indication there of how far and how well the fluid was reacting um, for the recoil. Um, it could recoil up to 620 millimetres, but the marker on there would go up to 580. After that, it would have a ceasefire mark on there, just to tell you there were problems.